So what is this imprinting control region? Well, the definition of the imprinting control region is that it's a DNA region that somehow regulates several imprinted genes found in a cluster. This imprinting control region, which we'll just refer to as ICR, is that non-coding RNA. Just like we saw on the last whiteboard, where that non-coding RNA regulated the expression of certain genes. In describing this imprinting control region, I want to bring back IGF2 and talk about that a little bit. So several boards ago, we talked about how IGF2 was maternally imprinted. And we saw the consequences of that, the good and the bad of that. But we didn't talk about how it was regulated. All right, so IGF2 revisited here. Let's talk about the maternal source first. So here's our chromatin. We have our IGF2 gene here. And then we have another gene down here, the non-coding RNA gene. And its name is H19. Down here we have several regulatory sequences these enhancers. And right here, in front of H19, we have a region. It's not a gene, it's a region here. So I'll draw it as a circle just to differentiate that. And we call this region the DMR. DMR stands for differentially methylation region. Now you already know from the first discussion of IGF2 that IGF2 is not going to be expressed. How is it not expressed? Well, DMR here is not methylated. This allows H19 to be expressed. Now, a protein will bind here to this non-methylated DMR region. And this protein is called CTCF. And what it does, we call it a, an insulator. It's a repressor, but it's also an example of something known as an insulator. And what it does is it allows the effect of these enhancers to only enhance H19 expression. It cannot enhance the expression of IGF2. Now we'll talk in a, in a moment on the next board, I believe, that how we're going to further regulate IGF2. So this is just one level here. This is just preventing the enhancement of the expression. CTCF binds to this unmethylated DMR, prevents these enhancers from helping express IGF2 and allowing it to only affect H19. So we're constantly going to be making this non-coding RNA from H19. Now let's consider this as the paternal source of IGF2. And I'll draw that down here. So it's going to have the exact same region, so let's go ahead and draw those in here real quick. Okay, so we have our paternal source drawn here. And let's remember that the IGF2 from the paternal source is expressed. How does it do that? Well, DMR, the differentially methylated region here, is methylated. This prevents the CTCF protein from binding. It being methylated, will cause H19 to not be expressed. The enhancers can now help express IGF2. So now we're getting expression from IGF2 because these enhancers, which are way downstream, can exert their effect upon this gene now because they're no longer blocked by this insulator, CTCF. So kind of in a classic experiment, they were able to show that H19 played this role. And in doing so, they, they do these experiments where they have to show that H19 is necessary and sufficient. They showed that it was necessary because if they disrupted H19, removed it from the genome here, we would get expression of IGF2 from the maternal source and from the paternal source. So we would get overexpression. Having the double the amount of IGF2, of expressed IGF2, would cause a larger placenta and a larger birth weight. So that's how they showed that it was first necessary. Without it, 
you don't see imprinting and it affects the overall health of the of the baby now you had to show that it was sufficient and what they did to show that it was sufficient was they took H19 here and they placed it in front of a gene that was not involved in, in imprinting. So what they did was, as I said, they moved H19 and they placed it in front of a different gene. And this gene they put it in front of was beta globin. Beta globin is usually expressed from both maternal and paternal copies. But by placing H19 in front of it, as just as we see here with IGF2, we now see beta globin being maternally imprinted. So in this way, they showed that they showed H19's importance by showing it was necessary and sufficient to exert its imprinting effect. Now the question is, how does H19 and the DMR regions here? How does it know to behave one way in the maternal source and the other way in the paternal source? And the short answer is we don't really know yet. We're still trying to figure this out. But let's talk just a little bit about what the signals here could be that are saying to either imprint or not imprint depending on its source. So what we want to talk about here, here are DMRs, imprinting signals. What is in that DMR that's associated with specific non-coding RNA? What is it that indicates to be methylated or not methylated to exert that imprint imprinting. Well interestingly the DMR sequence is not well conserved. It would have been easy to explain if DMRs associated with imprinted genes had a very consistent sequence, a conserved sequence, but that's not the case. So it's not likely in the sequence itself. If you remember I talked about the repetitive sequences. DMRs contain repetitive sequences. Not the same because it's not conserved, but we're more likely to see repetitive sequences in DMRs of, of imprinted genes as opposed to promoter regions in non-imprinted genes. The next thing could be the CPG repeats that we've talked about before. Now there's nothing unique about these CPG repeats, but there are some who believe that maybe the amount or the numbers of CPG repeats could help identify imprinted genes. Maybe it's the order of them. Maybe that has something to do with it. What that code is, we don't know, but it is a, a hypothesis. All we know for sure is that imprinted genes are heavily methylated, so we know that. And non-imprinted genes are void of methyl groups. But we don't really know how or what that signal is that says to imprint certain genes. So that's kind of a sad ending to this story. We don't really know the answer yet, but the good news is that means there's a lot of work to be done. Now we don't know much about the signals, but there is some suggestions that chromatin modification at the DMR affects gene imprinting. So let's look at our IGF2 gene again. And we'll start with the maternal source on top here, the one that is imprinted, and then the paternal source on the bottom here, the one that is not imprinted. Let's quickly draw the gene here, or the piece of chromatin here. Here's the IGF2 gene, but this is the IGF2 gene. Remember, mom's copy here is not expressed, but dad's copy is expressed. And we have our H19 gene here, the non-coding RNA gene. And we know mom's copy is expressed and dad's copy is not expressed. We know that mom's copy here in front of H19 at this DMR region is not methylated. And at the DMR region for the paternal copy, it is methylated. We know that this region here in the paternal copy is more compacted. And because of that, it's less sensitive to DNAs. 
If we isolate this DNA, we expose it to the DNA degrading enzyme DNase, this area is not degraded because, one would predict, the methyl groups here recruit heterochromatin material and forms the heterochromatin and protects it from DNase. Up here, this region between IGF2 and H19, that's not methylated, it is more sensitive to DNase because it's not protected by methylation and heterochromatin. The paternal copy here, the histones in this region, contain H3K9 methylation and H3K27 methylation. Remember, this methylation at these positions are known to prevent expression of associated genes, in this case, H19. Up here, the maternal copy, the H3 and H4, are heavily acetylated, which is linked to expression of genes associated with the H3, H4 acetylation, in this case, H19. How it's targeting these, how it's identifying certain DMR regions, we don't know. But we do know that epigenetics is involved because we know that the H3 and H4s are either acetylated or methylated appropriately. The mechanisms that say in the maternal source during egg development it should be acetylated and in sperm development that it should be methylated, we don't know that yet. To summarize up to this point, we understand that DMR sites here somehow signal to turn this gene on or off, the H19 gene. We don't know what those signals are, but we know that it will influence the enhancer sequences here to either enhance or not enhance the expression of IGF2. What I want to talk about next is something beyond those enhancers. How is it that we're going to initiate the transcription of these genes? The enhancers are just going to help move it along. It's a very important part of it, but how are we going to keep these on or off? There's something else involved, and it might not surprise you to learn that we're going to talk about another DMR sites here in IGF2. A little bit different, but... So as I just said, what we're going to talk about here is how is IGF2 imprinted? So let's draw a chromatin here. And here's our H19 that we've talked about before, and IGF that we've also talked about before. We talked about this DMR region here, but what I haven't talked about are three DMR regions found within the gene IGF2 itself. These we're going to call, in order, DMR0, DMR1, DMR2. In all cases, DMR of H19 and these three found in IGF2, they're all paternally methylated. DMR is methylated to keep H19 off, which then allows IGF2 to be expressed. These DMR regions in IGF2 are a little different. DMR0 here, I'm not going to talk much about it except to say that it is expressed in the placenta. I'm going to focus on these two here, DMR1 and DMR2. These are both expressed in somatic cells. DMR1 has a silencer function. DMR2, when methylated, has an activator function, which is a little different when we think about methylation. DMR1, silencer function when methylated. DMR2 activator function when methylated. Now I want to show you what's happening here maternally and paternally. Before I show you, I'm going to tell you now that DMR here is going to interact with DMR1 and DMR2 by looping the chromosome around. So let me go ahead and show you what I'm talking about. So again, we're going to talk about the maternal source first. And remember, the result is going to be that IGF2 is not going to be expressed. So in the maternal example here, DMR, this one here, oh I erased these, this was remember 0, 1, and 2 DMR. So DMR from H19 will say protects DMR1 and 2 from being methylated. 
And it's going to do this by DMR interacting with DMR1. So let's show how that's going to happen down here. We're going to loop the chromosome around. We're going to have DMR here which H, with H19 here. DMR from the H19 here is going to have bound to it CFTR that we've talked about before. And there's other proteins involved, which we don't know yet what they are. They haven't been identified yet. But in forming this loop here, what's happened is we've established two domains. The domain here on the right that forms this loop is the inactive domain. Over here is the active domain. Anything in this loop isn't going to be expressed. And though I forgot to draw it here, remember I said DMR is going to interact with DMR1 from IGF2. And upstream of DMR1 is IGF2. And IGF2 now is in this inactive domain and it cannot be expressed. I should draw this gene a little bit bigger here because I want to remind you that in this gene we still have our DMR2 site. So in the maternal source for a mom, DMR1 interacts with DMR using this CFTR insulator repressor here. In this interaction here, it pushes the IGF2 into this inactive domain. In this inactive domain, it cannot be expressed. Now in the paternal cop, I'm not going to erase all this, I'm just going to adjust it just a little bit to show how just a small little tweak in the system can allow IGF2 to be expressed. So this is going to be the paternal copy. So now in this paternal copy, what's going to happen is DMR from H19 is going to interact with not DMR1, but DMR2. So what's going to happen is this is going to shift down here. The whole chromatin is going to move down a little bit so that DMR2 can now interact with DMR. Also remember, this being the paternal copy, CFTR is not going to be bound here. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. And through the magic of time-lapse photography, this is going to shift down here. So now you can see this shift has occurred. DMR from H19 is now in position to interact with DMR2. And though the proteins haven't yet been identified, we have evidence that there are proteins involved that help link DMR to DMR2. Now what has happened is IGF2 is no longer in this inactive domain. It has been shifted to this active domain. And now IGF2 can be expressed. And though I didn't draw it here, I just realized DMR1 is actually in the gene of IGF2. I guess I could adjust the drawing. I have that power. So again, in the paternal copy from dad, DMR2 shifts down here so that it can interact with DMR from H19. In doing so, we have pushed the gene IGF2 into this active domain of the chromatin, leaving this inactive dom domain behind. H19 is still in the active domain, but remember in the paternal source here, it's methylated, so it's not gonna be expressed. So as you can see, there's a lot of things going on here. How DMR is ex affecting the expression of H19, how that influences these enhancers, which I didn't draw here, but they're still there. I just didn't draw them. They're still here. And how these enhancers may or may not affect whether or not IGF2 will be enhanced in its expression. How the chromatin plays this very dynamic structural change to move IGF2 from inactive to active regions all depending upon if it's a maternal uh, or a paternal source, which is really amazing if you think about it. As, as the gametes are being developed, something about the environment of either sperm development or egg development indicates whether or not all this stuff is going to happen. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I do want to highlight just how much more complicated this is. And I'm going to title this whiteboard IGF2 is not alone. Remember, earlier on we said that these imprinted genes exist in clusters. So I want to just write a few things here for you to remember. IGF2 is on the distal end chromosome 7 in mice 
or 11 in humans. In both mice and humans, it's less than 3 megabases from the telomere, the end of the chromosome. In this general region, of about one megabasis, there is a large imprinted domain or cluster. Within this large cluster here, there are at least 10 mRNA coding genes, those that will go on and make a protein eventually, and these 10 mRNA genes are controlled by two different ICRs. And remember, ICR stands for imprinting control regions, and these are usually those non-coding RNAs, which is the case here as well for both of these. And they're called ICR1 and ICR. They are both independent of each other, and they control their own subset of genes. ICR1 is H19. So at this point we've talked a lot about imprinting, how genes are imprinted, how they are not imprinted. We talked a little bit about how what would happen if imprinting didn't occur. We also mentioned that it's a fairly rare event. Most genes are not imprinted. But one thing we haven't talked about yet, and it's mainly because we don't know, is why are some of these genes imprinted? If it's happening, and it appears to be a fairly recent event in evolution, it's found most predominantly in mammals and plants, what is the evolutionary advantage? That's the question that we don't know yet. And we will speculate on this as we move forward because it's an it's a interesting thing to think about. Why is it that there is some kind of advantage to having imprinting, where one gene is expressed from the paternal or the maternal source. But we'll have to cover that a different day. Because that's all I'm going to say for this um, podcast. But as you're going through this material, if you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye.